The title of the sermon, The True Vine, it's based on John 15, verses 1 to 8. Jesus gave the allegory of the true vine. During the discourse in John 15, Jesus spoke metaphorically, making comparisons for the purpose of illustration. He used an illustration which the people of the day could understand. We too can understand this illustration today. Jesus delivered the discourse to his disciples, specifically his apostles, who he sent out with authority, with the exception of Judas, who would betray him. John 18. There are three main characters in the illustration. First, God the Father is the vine dresser. In John 15, 1, Jesus the Son is the vine, verse 5. The disciples of Jesus are the branches, verses 5 and 8. There are others, too, not explained in the allegory. Jesus speaks of they in verse 6. This may refer to the angels of God, as we see in Matthew 13 and 39. Jesus had celebrated the Passover with the apostles in the upper room, where he told them that one of them would betray him in Matthew 26, 17 to 25. Jesus then instituted the Lord's Supper, verses 26 to 29, and afterwards told his apostles how that they would be made to stumble and that Peter would deny him, verses 30 to 35. Along with his apostles, Jesus went to Gethsemane, verses 36 to 46, and prior to being betrayed and arrested, verses 47 to 56. This gives us a brief background for our allegory today. The Apostle John gives additional information of this period. In his book, in John 13 to 17, prior to the betrayal of Jesus in John 18. Hearing about the betrayal and the denial of Jesus, the apostles were troubled, John 14. He begins by saying, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. After leaving the upper room as they headed towards Gethsemane, where he would pray, in John 14, 31, Jesus delivered a discourse to strengthen his disciples. In John 15 to 17. You might ask, why the symbol of the vine? We are not told in the text if there was anything that was said or anything that they saw on the way to Gethsemane. We do know that the vine was familiar to the disciples. In Matthew 26, 29, we learned how the apostles drank of the fruit of the vine. We also know that Israel at times was portrayed in the Old Testament as a vine or a vineyard, such as in Psalm 80, 8 to 16, and Isaiah 5, 1 to 7. The allegory of the true vine was originally spoken to the apostles of Jesus. However, the message of the allegory can apply in general to all the disciples of Jesus. Let's begin today by reading the passage in John 15, 1 to 8. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. 
for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. The true vine. In John 15, verse 1, the first part of the verse, we see that Jesus is the vine. He said, I am the true vine. The branches depend on the vine for their life. Metaphorically, Jesus is the vine. The vine is the source of life for the branches. Likewise, Jesus is the source of life for the disciples. Jesus is not just the vine, but the true vine. The term true is applied to that which is genuine. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, Peter preached, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name by which we must be saved. Acts 4, verse 12. Jesus is the true vine. He is the genuine vine. There is no other. Earlier, Jesus spoke to the apostle Thomas. In John 14 and 6, saying, I am the vine. He said, I am the true vine. In John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Note some instances of how the Apostle John used this word true in his books and epistles. For instance, in the Lord's Prayer, the Son to the Father, the Lord spoke of the only true God in John 17, 3. In John 17, 1 to 5, Jesus spoke to his Father in heaven. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. We see in the passage that Jesus is able to give eternal life. In the passage, we see that Jesus speaks to the Father in prayers, describing him as the only true God. The Apostle John also wrote of Jesus as the true God. In 1 John 5, 20, saying, And we know that the Son of God has come, come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his son Jesus Christ this is the true God and eternal life three times in this passage he uses the term true concerning Jesus he is the true God and eternal life the Apostle John also wrote in Revelation 3 and 7, These things says he who is holy, he who is true. Remember in the allegory, Jesus said, I am the true vine. He is the genuine vine. There is no other vine. He is the source of life, eternal life for all in him. Second, we see the vine dresser in John 15, verse 1. 
in the second part of the verse. Jesus said, and my father is the vine dresser. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. The vine dresser, a person who cultivates and prunes the grapevine, does everything he can for the vine to see that the branches of the vine bear fruit. Older versions read husbandman. The husbandman practices husbandry. In this case, the cultivating of grapevines or the grapevine. Metaphorically, the father is the vine dresser. It is Jesus who is true. The father gives his attention to Jesus and those who are in him. Third, we see the branches in John 15, verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Jesus says that the vine dresser takes away or cuts off every branch in him that does not bear or produce fruit. He describes the fruitless branch and later those that are cast out as a branch. Verse 6. The branch must be in the vine in order to yield grapes. Likewise, the Father takes away every disciple that does not bear fruit, metaphorically, good works or good deeds. To bear fruit, one must be in him. To be in him and not bear fruit is a problem. Jesus warns of the danger of apostasy for the disciple who no longer follows and obeys his word. Jesus also taught that his disciples were salt and light. He used the metaphor of salt of the earth and light of the world to describe his disciples, saying, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In the allegory of the true vine, Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Here we see in the metaphors of salt of the, light, salt of the earth and the light of the world, how that they were to, to be these things. But what good is salt if it loses its flavor? To be cast out, trampled underfoot by men. But Jesus taught his disciples to be the light of the world. People may see their good works and glorify their Father in heaven. Of course, in the parable, the, the allegory, rather, of the true vine, Jesus said that those who bear much fruit glorify the Father. He said in verse 8, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Paul wrote concerning the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 to 23. He said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And so the fruit of the Spirit, of course, we produce these things in our lives as Christians. John 15, 2, Jesus continues saying, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. The vine dresser prunes every branch that bears fruit so that it, the branch, may bear more fruit. The term for prunes can also mean cleans, 
which is reflected in older versions, purgeth and cleanseth. In this particular context, prune fits, given the, given the metaphor. A related term to prunes is translated in verse 3 as cleans. And so every branch that bears fruit, he cleans, or in this context, he prunes. Likewise, every disciple that bears fruit, the father prunes, or in the sense of trims, so that he will be even more fruitful or bear even more fruit. The father prunes by means of the word, John 15, 3. Or, as some suggest, the father also does so by chastening or disciplining his children. Hebrews 12, verses 3 to 11. But particularly in verse 3, he prunes his apostles by means of the word. He said, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Jesus tells his apostles that they are already clean or pure because of the word that he had spoken to them. They were clean by the means of the word. As the vine dresser prunes the branches, the apostles were already clean or pruned by, like a branch by the father. The father sent the son and the word of the Son was that of the Father. As disciples today, who hear and obey the teachings of Jesus, we become more fruitful. We bear more fruit as we respond to his teaching, to his word, the word of God. Let's note this word clean in the book of John. John used the word clean earlier when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. In John 13, 10, Jesus said, you are clean, but not all of you. According to John, Jesus knew who would betray him. Therefore, Jesus said in John 13, 11, you are not all clean. Judas, who was betraying Jesus, was not clean. Jesus was not speaking of outward purity, but inward purity. In John 15, verse 4, Jesus continued the allegory, saying, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus tells his disciples to see to it that they abide in in him. The term abide may be translated as remain, such as in John 15, verse 16, I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Jesus had appointed the apostles. The branch cannot bear fruit of or by itself. The branch can only bear fruit or yield grapes, if the branch abides in the vine. Likewise, the disciples cannot bear fruit unless they abide or remain in him. This described their continued loyalty and fellowship. They were to be steadfast and enduring. They were to continue keeping his word. John 15, 7 and 10. This also suggests the possibility of not doing so. They may cease abiding or remaining in him and producing fruit. Jesus said in verse 4, abide in me and I in you. He is in you in the sense of his words being in you. Later in verse 7, Jesus said, abide in me and my words abide in you. I in you, or my words abide in you. 
We're not told in this passage how one is brought in him. However, we learn elsewhere that people are baptized into him, into Christ. In verses such as Romans 6 and verse 3 and Galatians 3 and 27. We are baptized into Christ. How else do we get into Christ? Once into Christ, we must remain in Christ. Verse, 15, verse 5 of chapter 15 reads, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. At the beginning of the allegory, Jesus said in verse 1, I am the true vine. Well, Jesus is the vine. The disciples are the branches. The branches do not refer to denominations. The branches refer to the disciples. As Jesus said in verse 4, the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Likewise, Jesus says, for without me, you can do nothing. The branches are totally dependent upon the vine. Likewise, the disciples are completely dependent upon Christ. And he who abides in him, he it is that bears much fruit or is fruitful. Verse 6, Jesus says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Earlier, Jesus said that the vine dresser takes away every branch that does not bear fruit. Verse 2, Jesus now says that if anyone does not abide in him, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, verse 6. The fruitless branch is thrown away, withers or dries up. Such are gathered, thrown into the fire, and they are burned. Jesus, Jesus teaches that disciples who bear no fruit will be cast out. A branch apart from the vine withers. Likewise, apart from Jesus, the disciple who is cast away will metaphorically be withered or dried up. Again, note that there is the possibility of apostasy, of people falling away from the Lord, failing to keep his word. In John 17, 12, Jesus told how that Judas was lost. The image of being thrown into the fire is a picture of judgment, such as in Matthew 13 and 42. He who does not abide in the Son, obeying his word, John the Baptist said the wrath of God abides on him. John 3, 35 to 36, the Apostle John records, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. Jesus continues the allegory saying in verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Jesus promises that if his disciples will abide in him and his words abide in them, they will ask what they desire and it will be done for them. This is not an unconditional promise. Knowing his words, they will ask whatever they wish according to his will, and it will be done for them. They want to bear much fruit. Verse 8. Consider the promises of Jesus for his apostles. 
John 14, 12 to 14. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus gave his apostles the power to perform miracles, to confirm his word. And we see how that his apostles performed miracles during Jesus' ministry. But after Jesus' earthly ministry, his apostles would continue to perform miracles to confirm the word. And as long as they were alive, they continued to do so. The apostles had the ability to pass on these gifts to other people, though those people did not possess the same ability to pass on the gift. In John 16, 23 to 24, Jesus said, In that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Jesus would send the Holy Spirit, Comforter, to guide them into all truth, his apostles. We see that through their works, these miraculous uh, works of God, they would confirm the word and they would produce much fruit. Of course, as disciples today, we who ask according to his will, his will will be done. Of course, knowing his word uh, and his will as recorded in the word, we can ask accordingly your will be done. Of course, Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. To pray, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As disciples, we want his will to be done. And so we, we want to produce fruit. Of course, those in him that who no longer produce fruit fall away. Uh, the the Allegory teaches how that they will be cast off, cast away. Here in the passage in John 15 and 8, Jesus said, By this my disciples glorify, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Jesus tells his disciples that when they bear much fruit, they show or prove themselves to be his disciples. His Father is glorified, he said, when his disciples are fruitful. All is to the Father's glory. After the allegory of the true vine in verses 1 to 8, Jesus continues to talk to his apostles. He says in verse 9, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may, be, may remain in you, and that my, your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus continues to, to teach how that he would give his life for them. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Of course, the world will know that we are his disciples by our love for one another. As we see later in the, in the passage, Jesus gave his life for us. Let's summarize the 
allegory of the true vine. Jesus is the only way of salvation for those in him. If we are to have eternal life, it will be in Christ. Those in Jesus Christ who abide in him, following his word, who bear fruit, the Father will help to bear more fruit. However, those in him who will not abide in him, the Father will take away and will ultimately face judgment. The Father is glorified by the fruit we bear as disciples. Of course, as we pray, we'll pray according to his will. Your will be done. We will know his, his word as in the scriptures, and we will abide in his word. We will produce fruit. And the Father will help us to grow, to produce more and more fruit, to be more fruitful. But those who will fall away, those who will no longer abide in him and produce fruit, will be cast, cast away. Today, the lesson is one of faithfulness. Be faithful to God. Jesus died so that we could be forgiven that we may live in holiness and righteousness and bear fruit. Abide in him as Christians and continue to bear more and more fruit to do good works, good deeds. Of course, we know that we'll be judged accordingly. The invitation of Christ is open. Are you in Christ? It is in Christ that there is salvation. Every spiritual blessing is in him. Are you in him? If so, abide or remain in Christ, following his words. A Christian is one who belongs to Christ, who follows his teachings. If you are in Christ, however, you're not being fruitful. You're not producing fruit. We encourage you to repent and to be faithful to Christ. Repent, repent and pray God that perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. If you're not a Christian, if you're not yet in Christ, hear the gospel. Jesus died for you. Repent of your sins, having believed in him. Confess your faith and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for remission of your sins. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. We hope that this lesson has been helpful to you. The purpose of the lesson today was to encourage you to be faithful to the Lord. We thank you for being here, and we encourage you to seek the Lord in all that you do.